In the late 1800s, x-rays were all the rage. And could you blame anyone because x-rays are awesome. They are invisible rays that allow you to see through things and you can see bones and stuff. It's so cool. And so every scientist was trying to discover uh, their own kind of x-rays. Are there other forms of invisible rays out there? And one of the scientists involved in this search was a French physicist named Henri Becquerel. Now Becquerel was looking at various materials, especially phosphorescent materials. These are materials that will, will glow in the dark if you expose them to, to x-rays. And to, to really dig into this, he was uh, taking these phosphorescent materials and then putting them on top of a photographic plate, taking pictures of them basically. Uh, but he would put a piece of paper between the phosphorescent material and the photographic plate to you know to see if there are invisible rays that he could pick up with the photographic plate. Turns out every single phosphorescent material uh, was, was blocked by the, by the piece of paper, by the sheet, uh, so that there was, there was no invisible rays, it was all just visible light, it was very boring. Except for uranium. He found that uranium could uh, glow in this invisible way, could emit invisible radiation that could penetrate pieces of paper. Now that was super weird. And initially people called these things Becquerel rays, which was the fashion at the time. Cause remember everyone was fascinated by invisible rays. Thankfully, that name didn't stick. Uh, it was Pierre and Marie Curie who renamed this phenomenon radioactivity, and that is a much, much better name than Becquerel rays. Uh, and in the early 1900s, as, as scientists were investigating the nature of this radioactivity, they found it was weird because not only would uranium emit some sort of invisible radiation, it would also transform. It would also transmute. It would also change into a different element. And this seems so weird. Like why should nature transform from one element to another? Why should that be allowed? In almost all cases, we never see that. The elements that surround you, almost all of them are just stable. They hang around for forever. They've always been here and they always will be here. Forever. But not uranium. And then the Curies discovered that uranium was not alone. They discovered brand new elements like radium and polonium that had these exact same properties where they would, if you just take a lump of uranium or polonium or radium and put it on the table and watch it, it will slowly over time transform into something else. You don't even have to do anything. You just sit there and wait and it becomes something else. And in the meantime, in the process of becoming something else, it emits these invisible forms of radiation. Now, what did society choose to do with this newfound idea of radioactivity? That's right, merchandising, merchandising, merchandising. You could buy radium infused water. You could buy radium pills. You could even get radium enemas, which is really uncomfortable to think about, but yes, it was a real thing. But just think of that this is before we even had atomic theory. We didn't even know what was happening inside of atoms. We didn't understand the nucleus yet and we're taking radium pills and shoving it up. Anyway. Moving on, it was a pretty crazy time, but eventually both experiment and theory caught up and we were able to get a handle on what radioactivity really is. One of the first things we were able to understand is that there isn't just one kind of radioactivity, there are three. And the three classifications were based on how much work it took to stop these invisible radiation that was coming out of radioactive elements. As so we call them alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha radiation or alpha rays are the easiest to stop. You could just have a sheet of paper and an alpha rays wouldn't make it through to the other side, okay? Beta rays took a little bit longer. You need to say a thick sheet of metal to stop a beta ray. Uh, and then the last kind, gamma rays, you need an entire block of lead before you could stop a gamma ray. And so that's how we got the three classifications. 
it would be decades until we understood what those three kinds of radiation were and what were causing them. It turns out that alpha rays or alpha radiation is, is a little tiny helium nucleus. It's two protons and two neutrons getting spit out of a nucleus and, and just flying out into, into the void. And so that's why a piece of paper can stop it because the helium nucleus, nucleus is actually pretty big and heavy and it just bounces off the piece of paper. The beta radiation or beta rays, these are actually electrons that uh, occur when a proton inside of a nucleus uh, just one day decides to become a neutron. It just flips its identity, outspits an electron. And so, you know, electron, a high energy electron, it, it's electrically charged. So if you have a piece of metal, it's easy to block it, but it's very, very tiny. So if you have a piece of paper, it just, it just slips on through. Uh, by the way, that process also emits a, an anti-neutrino, but understandably those are a little bit harder to spot. And then lastly, gamma rays, this turns out to be a form of, of radiation, of electromagnetic radiation, the highest energy form of electromagnetic radiation, even more energetic than x-rays. And so yeah, that you've got a single photon with a lot of energy, you need a whole block of lead in order to stop that sucker. Uh, so as we're beginning to understand these different kinds of radiation, we began to understand the, the nuclear processes that were, that were leading to it. And, and the big idea here is that uh, an atomic nucleus is not always stable. And, and the best way to think of an atomic nucleus, I know that the generic picture is a bunch of little hard BBs like glued together and like, okay, there you go. There's your atomic nucleus. Instead, I want you to think of atomic nuclei as as sloshing bags of goo. They're wiggly and wobbly and amorphous. A picture in your head an amoeba. That, that's a better image to me of an atomic nucleus than a bunch of little BBs all glued together. And in this sloshing bag of goo, you have a lot of competing forces. You have the strong nuclear force, which is trying to hold everything together. But on, on nuclear scales, it's, it's not the greatest. Really, the strong nuclear force is really great at keeping protons together and neutrons together. And then there's some leftover extra force that creates the atomic nuclei. But as you can imagine, things, things peter out after a while. Uh, but then you also have electromagnetism. You have the electrostatic force. Those protons are all positively charged and they positively hate each other. They don't want to be in the nucleus together. They would rather be flying apart. So they, there's this resistance there, this, the, this repulsion. Plus you have the weak nuclear force that shows up like, like, like that uncle at the family gathering that no one really invited but somehow figured out when it is. And you don't really want him there, but he shows up anyway and makes a bunch of bad jokes. But it was pretty gold. Hilarious. Um, that is the weak nuclear force. And so that um, just sometimes shows up. In this sloshing bag of goo, you can have stable situations where the protons and neutrons can just hang out there forever. But you can also have unstable situations. If there are too many neutrons, the strong nuclear force has a really hard time keeping everyone together. It's like, no, 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 come back. It's like chasing after a, a bunch of dogs, like a little puppy. No, 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 come back. No, 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 come back, come back, come back, come back. Okay, it can, it can get a little bit tired. And if you have too many protons, then the electrostatic repulsion between those protons is going to overwhelm the strong nuclear force and things are going to split. Obviously, this doesn't happen with every element. Otherwise, there'd be radioactive decay happening all the time and it'd be really gross. And it also doesn't happen with every isotope of every element. You can have an element with a certain number of protons and neutrons and everything's hunky-dory, but then you sprinkle in a few extra neutrons and now all of a sudden you have a radioactive material because you've upset the balance of these forces in this sloshing bag of goo. But the interesting thing, one of the many interesting things about radioactive decay is that it's a quantum process. You know, an emission of an alpha radiation, that's when you have this, this sloshing nucleus that becomes unstable and two protons and neutr two neutrons just pinch off and fly away. Or you have this unstable situation and a proton needs to turn into a neutron or vice versa, out comes a beta ray. Uh, the gamma radiation usually comes along 
along with the other two processes because once this nucleus transforms itself and turns into a different, more stable element, that element is usually in a higher energy state. It's got a bad case of the jitters and it just needs to emit some energy and the best way to emit that energy is through a high energy photon, aka a gamma ray. Now these decay processes, they cost energy. They take energy. You have to take a piece of yourself of you know, this proton and neutron and you have to spit it out or if you, you have to transform yourself. These processes take energy. And in a classical world, that would never happen. If a process costs energy and you don't have the cash, you can't do it. You simply can't. In a classical world, you, can, you simply can't. But in a quantum world, you can. And in a quantum world, you can have a nucleus, a sloshing bag of goo, that is pretty unstable and wants to transform. Once it transforms, once it completes the transformation, it gets rid of the extra protons or neutrons, it will be in a more stable state, it will be in a lower energy state, and it will be in a happier state. But in order to make that transformation happen, it has to temporarily spend some energy and then get down there. In a classical world, that can't happen, but in a quantum world, you are allowed to do that. Where you can have this nucleus just hanging out and then you have to say two protons and two neutrons. They want to be inside even though they don't prefer it. They're bound by energy to be inside the nucleus. And then they just find themselves outside the nucleus. This is a process called quantum tunneling. They're just like, Burr. next time you look, they're outside the nucleus. They're free to go. Now this nucleus is in a lower energy state. It's overall happier that it got rid of that Hide of, of that helium nucleus of the two protons and two neutrons, it had to spend a little bit, a bit of energy, but quantum mechanics allows you to do that. And so quantum mechanics is key to understanding radioactivity. Without quantum mechanics, you simply don't have radioactivity. You don't have any radioactive elements at all. Uh, but because it's a quantum process, that means it's a random process. If I were to give you a single atom of uranium, here you go, here's your, your, your uranium, one single atom. You will never ever know exactly when that uranium will decay into something else. You never know when that process of radioactive decay will happen. You simply don't know. And you'll never know. It might take a microsecond, it might take a hundred seconds, it might take a billion years. You simply don't know because it's a quantum process, it's a random process. You don't know when it's gonna happen. However, if I bring together a lot of uranium atoms, and if I have a rock of uranium, I have a lot, I have billions upon billions upon billions of uranium atoms in there, then I know for sure, with every second that goes by, that some of those atoms are going to radioactively decay. I don't know which ones. I can't point to any one of those individual atoms and say, hey, yep, that's the one, that's, that's what's coming up next. I don't know but I do know if they have billions upon billions of them, that every second some of them will decay. And this is where we get the concept of half-life. If I have a sizable amount of a radioactive element, it will, guaranteed over time, decay. It will transmute, it will transform into another element, and it will give off radioactive emissions of some form as it does that. And the half-life is a measure of how long that takes. So if I have a lump of, say, uranium, and I wait one half-life, whether it's a month, a year, 10 years, then I will have half the original amount that I did before. And then I wait another half-life, and I've got a quarter, another half-life, I've got an eighth, a sixteenth, and so on. The, the sheer number of statistics of atoms inside a single lump is what allows me to say with confidence what the half-life of these elements are, even though I can't apply to any single individual element. It goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that radioactive materials are very dangerous. Alpha rays, if you ingest, alpha radiation, if you ingest them, they can damage your insides. Beta radiation can hit your skin and damage uh, your cells. Gamma radiation is, is absolutely nasty. Uh, is a cancer causing, it, it ruptures cells and DNA is just overall a bad idea. So please, please, if someone offers you a radium enema, 
yeah, don't take them up on that offer. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week. Please like, share, and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash pmsider. The link is down below. I really do appreciate it.